everybody. Thanks for joining us for another OpenShift Commons briefing. My name is Michael Waite from Red Hat, and we are bringing you our special Veterans Day edition of the Operator Hours show. Today we have Mark Brewer and Hugh McKee from Lightbend. And Mark and Hugh are going to be talking about fueling digital transformation with cloud native applications. Mark and Hugh, why don't you give us a little introduction and tell us who you are. Hi, everyone. My name's Hugh again, and I'm a developer advocate for Lightbend on the Akka platform. So my role is uh, pretty enviable. I've been a developer for many decades, but now I get to uh, talk to people about Akka technology, about Lightbend technology. I speak at conferences around the world do lots of videos, do lots of events like this. And, uh, and also I get to write a, a lot of cool demos with, um, my favorite thing is adding some eye candy. So that's gonna be showing you later on in, in this se session is a couple of demos of Aqua running in OpenShift environments in Kubernetes uh, with uh, some fun eye candy pieces to it. And, and it looks like you have a bunch of eye candy on the wall in the background there. How's yes, the electric bill? This is my, uh, my this is my uh, battle station, they call it, and then, you know, some of the stuff I've been working on. You'll be seeing some of it in a little bit. Excellent. We're looking forward to that. Um, Mark, over to you. How are you today? Good. Like uh, like Michael said, my name is Mark Brewer. I'm the CEO of Lightben. Been in this uh, open source industry for quite a while, actually 20 years now, or I think 21 years. My first company in the open source space was Covalent, and Covalent was the company behind the Apache web server and the Tomcat servlet container. I actually had an opportunity to work with Red Hat back then as, as well. But I've also, um, from there, I should say, I went to Spring Source. So I was part of the Spring team that uh, took, took Spring Framework and the Tomcat product and brought it to market. And then, of course, that company got acquired by VMware back in 2009. And then a few years later became a spin out of VMware and it was uh, pivotal. And so anyway, I, I stayed with Spring Source until I, I'm sorry, I stayed with VMware until I came here in 2012. Looking so you, forward to so talking been, about it. Since 2012? Yep. Hmm, okay. Yeah, the company was founded in 2011. I joined about a year later. <clears throat> okay. And light bend, bending of light, is there is there a uh, uh, um, any symbolism in the company name, or did you decide to just pick a name that was easy to pronounce and, and people wouldn't misspell it? Or how, how did they come up with the name Lightbend? We have a lot of our partners have, you know, uh, insect names, and some of them have farm animal names. And so, why Lightbend? Yeah, well, actually, we weren't Lightbend when we were founded. We were TypeSafe, and TypeSafe, the name, uh, spoke to type safety, which is one of the things that uh, Scala, the language that we're the, the vendor behind, uh, provides type safety. And so the name had a lot of meaning initially when the company was all about Scala and early on with the the, uh, the product, we focused on Scala developers only. Just a side note, uh, today and actually for the last seven years, Java has been our primary language that our customers utilize. But anyway, the company was type safe for its first five years of existence. We changed the name in 2016, went through a long exercise of trying to come up with a trademarkable name and a name that wasn't restrictive like TypeSafe was. TypeSafe was all about you know, Scala and the company provides the full platform. As I said, it's, it's targeted at the Java audience more than it is even the Scala audience. Regardless of that, um, we also struggled with people spelling the name wrong. <laughs> TypeSafe frequently became typeface, and uh, we never were a font company and never intended to be a font company. But you know, um, I, one, go ahead. Mark, I've been, for, I've been here for 19 years at Red Hat, and I completely get it about the, the spelling. I mean, yeah. Red, Hat, Red Hat's two words. It's capital R, capital H, and people make it be one word with, you know, lowercase h, so I, I, I completely get it. Matter of fact, we... We actually went through a huge logo rebranding exercise about a, two years ago. It probably an eighteen month project to kind of make the make the logo and the brand a little bit more consistent with modern day. And uh, so I completely get it how important the right branding is and and picking a name that that don't people don't misspell. Yeah. 
Well, we accomplished that with Lightbend. The other, other thing that we were trying to accomplish is find a name that was not only easy to remember and easy to spell, but didn't limit us. It wasn't tied to just one piece of technology like TypeSafe was. So I'm pleased with the name, but it doesn't have any other uh, specific meaning. Obviously, light, bend is, light bending is a real thing. It's, it's difficult to do. It takes a pretty big mass um, to, to actually bend light, but it can happen. Mostly, it's just a cool name, and, and like I said, isn't isn't uh, hard to spell. Okay, so that's how you got in the business by <clears throat> sort of transforming the company, or, or and so forth. What about your relationship with Red Hat? We've had a long-standing relationship with Red Hat, um, and even prior to that with IBM. Uh, we've worked with IBM on a number of fronts. In fact, they're actually an investor in our company. So our relationship with Red Hat extends through a number of, of, of relationships or areas in the relationship, specifically around OpenShift. So we have, you can find our, our technology on the Open, OpenShift um, Commons, find us on the marketplace as well, the Red Hat marketplace. Uh, we just last year, I guess it's this year, not last year, sorry, won the uh, Lightbender, I'm sorry, Red Hat's North American Partner Award. And um, we've certainly, found many customers that are using OpenShift with our technology. In fact, I'm going to be talking about that here a little bit later, but um, we have quite a few customers who've been leveraging the OpenShift technology along with Lightbend's platform. So I'd like to put in a gratuitous plug for, for Lightbend. You know, you folks have been a, 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 a member in good standing of the OpenShift Commons uh, community for quite some time. It's not trivial, you know, you mentioned that you folks you know, have um, an application that works with OpenShift and you're in the Red Hat marketplace operated by IBM. I just wanted to make sure that people understood that that's, that's not a trivial statement. That's not a, that's not a logo swap and putting it on a website saying I'm, I'm affiliated with some program. You folks right. have been working with our technical teams for quite some time to build and test your, your containers and, and most recently your, your Red Hat operator. So you folks have a right. Red Hat certified operator for OpenShift, and that enables companies then to be listed with a commercial offering in the, the, the Red Hat marketplace operated by IBM. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to point that out that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, the story for customers is people who want to run Lightbend on any of the Red Hat platforms, um, including OpenShift, can know that, you know, for the, the best day two supportability um, is assured because of the engineering integration that we've done together between our companies. So I thought I'd throw, I'd throw that out there. Yeah, I appreciate that. And we appreciate the partnership. Well, it, um, it's all about, it's all about doing it for the end customer. So nobody likes yeah. surprises. They want to try and run something in a production environment, especially now when we have all, you know, everything's multi-cloud and distributed everywhere. So, um, it's all about, you know, enhancing the customer's value. That's, that's right. my team's charge anyways. Um, right. Okay. So talk a little bit more about Lightbend, like what it is, what it does. Um, I know yeah, you so, was bringing it to Akka, you know, how did, you know, is it, is it one product or there multiple products or there, how does it work? Yeah. Before we jump into the product, I, I'll give you a quick history. So the company, as I mentioned, is started in 2011. The, the objective of the founders, that's Martin Odersky and Jonas Bonaire, was to help companies build distributed-based systems and bring it to a broader audience, a broader audience than, than previously could have built these kind of complex systems. Thinking back to you know, 2011, this predates cloud native as a, as a term or even something we thought about, but that's essentially what they were um, they were envisioning is that people are going to build systems that need to run in the cloud in an environment that's obviously distributed and not controlled by the developers or even the ops folks that, that um, might run those applications. So let's shift gears and talk about our, our technology and, and how it's being used. The, ex the use cases that are highlighted here, we'll talk about some, some uh, real customers, and they'll all be ones that are running on OpenShift. So real-time financial processes, obviously this can be not only um, time sensitive, but it also has to be really performant in that it can handle mass volumes of data and, and, and be able to process it in near real time. Hyper-personalization, being able to actually deliver 
contextually aware personalization uh, in, in near real time. Real-time analytics, similar to the financial processes, just being able to process a lot of data and come up with answers in a very short period of time. IoT, interesting use cases in infra, uh, Internet of Things type projects. Everything from Tesla with their, their power wall and virtual grid to uh, companies that are just tracking devices and trying to keep uh, collect all that information that comes off of a device and predict whether there might be a failure or something needs to be re replaced or repaired. Uh, simply application modernization. I'll talk about one customer where it was all about that. They had a very old legacy system that was getting harder and harder to maintain, and they just were looking for a way to bring it to newer technology, but make it easier for developers uh, to, to continue to maintain that application. And then finally, e-commerce. We see a lot of a lot of new e-commerce platforms built using the Lightman technology. So let's talk about some customers. Oh, actually, let's first talk about the platform. So you asked me about the product. We sell. Uh, the Aka platform and Aka data pipelines, essentially it's one product. It's the Aka platform. They're just as two personalities, if you will, or personas. One is focused on de delivering what you need to build reactive microservices and get them into production. That's the Aka platform at its core. And then Aka data pipelines brings in streaming technologies, both our own streaming technology, Aka streams, as well as some third party, uh, Spark and Flink and, and others that are widely adopted in the market. But in, in the Aka Data Pipelines product or persona, you can build streamlets that become core or integrated into the application that you're creating. And like I said, we'll talk about a couple of use cases there. All of this, of course, runs natively on OpenShift and uh, takes advantage of features and functionality that OpenShift and Kubernetes provides. So what does it deliver? Well, delivers performance. Obviously, with the use cases I highlighted, that should be a foregone conclusion. Reliability, something that, that you don't find in a lot of platforms, and more importantly, you don't find developers thinking about it as part of their core construct, that, that being embracing failure, that something might crash, that something might uh, go down, and you need it to, to pro need it to be able to heal itself so that there is no exposed or, or uh, experience from the users that something has failed. Scalability. One of the things we're really proud of is that, that Lightbend technology, and specifically Akka, is used to run some of the uh, most highly performant and biggest uh, web applications out there on the market, whether that's Spotify, Shopify, uh, parts of Lyft, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, all built on top of the Akka platform. So we use these every day. Don't think about them as being something that ever uh, fails or, or has issues. But you have to also recognize the amount of processing, the amount of users that are accessing these services in real time, and the system just runs or just performs. Next, efficiency. Efficiency is obviously important. You want to find ways to utilize your cloud infrastructure, whether it's running on Kubernetes or not. You want to make sure that it's taking advantage or, or only utilizing what it needs. And in a Kubernetes OpenShift world, uh, highly efficient, be able to run these things in a very small footprint. Uh, with with you know scale when you need it or availability when you need it. Real time talked about this already, but streaming of data and and processing of data in near real time, where you can actually make business critical decisions, uh, whether that be an AI or a machine learning based system or or a personalized uh, customer experience, be able to deliver that in in real time or near real time. So let's talk about some customer cases. First one, Brighthouse. This is, uh, Brighthouse, by the way, is a spin out from, uh, uh, I'll, I'll think of it because we're talking here, but they, they became a public company a couple of years ago, spun out of uh, one of the large insurance, MetLife. There we go, I knew I'd get it. Um, and the, the problem they were trying to solve was to reduce not just risk, but reduce the amount of time to process mass amounts of data to come up with answers on risks, you know, whether or not this, this was an insurance. Um, uh, policy that had a high risk or a lower risk. They were able to accomplish that and reduce it from 70 minutes or more down to less than 10 seconds. Now, this doesn't just mean that they can get an answer faster, but it also means that they can run these models much more frequently, so they can evaluate risk at a much more rapid and, and uh, frequent basis. Yeah, so with USAA, another uh, Red Hat OpenShift customer that um, was looking to improve the time it took to 
send out messages through all their different channels. If you don't know, USAA is an insurance provider for military families, um, and I think they have 10 million members or more. And one of the things that they they were were struggling with was being able to interact with their their member base in a in a way in which where you could get information when it was relevant to them. So if they got in a car accident, they wanted to uh, play, place a claim or let their insurance bro insurance agent know, take a picture of the accident and send it directly back to the to the uh, persons that would authorize a claim. Well, that used to take days. Now you can do it in real time. They replaced their entire undercore communication system that allows them to, to communicate with their, their members via email, via SMS, via actually phone and, and, and the like. So this application was, was started in 2017 or started being developed in 2017, went live in 2018. Their development team was able to get this into production in less than six months. And that was something that they, they didn't expect. They thought this was gonna be a much longer project. I mentioned this earlier, personalization, hyper-personalization um, in, in the cruising industry. When, when cruising happens again, obviously, cruise ships haven't been going out anywhere for the last nine months. But um, it's going to be a while for sure. It is. It is. Um, Norwegian, and, and we're actually working with a number of cruise line uh, companies that, that use our technology, all for the same type of application where it's about personalizing the experience of somebody who goes on, on a cruise. And that starts from the time you book the cruise, whether you do it on the web or over the phone or, or via their app. They actually have an app where you can book your, your cruise. But more importantly, it's the experience once you're on the cruise, booking your reservations, whether it's for dinner or for an excursion, if you're gonna go out on a snorkeling trip um, and, and you realize the weather is bad, you need to change that, that excursion to something else. Well, this, this experience, this personalized experience happens on the ship for everybody. And in, in, the, in the past, before they had this, you know, you used to have to book all of your, your reservations in advance and, you know, uh, days trying to get on the phone to, to change something if the weather looked like it was going to be bad. Now it all happens you know, in real time via the application. And like I said, this is something that we've seen with a number of the cruise line industries. Norwegian's been a customer of ours and a customer of Red Hat's for a number of years. Mark, how, do, how does that work? I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I, I get it. I, I get it that, you know, you don't have to book everything in advance, but how, does, how specifically does Lightbend and, and, your, and your products, Akka, actually improve that, the user experience of people on a cruise ship? It, I'm, not, I'm not picking it up. Yeah. So they built a they built an app that you experience via the phone or a tablet if you've got an iPad or something, and that application allows you to keep track of not only all the things you've booked but anything else that's available that you might want to try out, all the way down to your dinner reservations. Uh, you can even find out if there's a long line at a particular restaurant on the ship, but you don't want to go there for dinner or lunch because the line's too long. So it's all via an application, and you can also set up alerts so that uh, for your dinner reservations. If you want to uh, be notified that there's going to be a, a long line, then it'll alert you so you don't even bother going to that particular restaurant. Does that make sense? Okay. I know that Hugh is going to be giving us a demo later on as well. So, right. Um, and based on, based on all the eye candy that he has pr prepared, I think it, it will be something pretty interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. I've got a couple more use cases I thought I would share, and then we'll turn it over to Hugh and have him give, give the demo of the product. Rogers, Rogers Telecommunication, they're a Canadian tele telecommunication company. Uh, this was all about reducing costs, but also delivering a much better experience on their e-commerce site. So if you go to rogers.com, that site and, and the app where you can buy a phone, you can order services, whether you wanna change your cell phone coverage, or you want to add a new new family member or change a uh, you know some something else on your your plan. All of that's done via an app that was built using the Lightbend technology. So the the most important thing they were looking for was to reduce their footprint in infrastructure um, while making sure the system stayed up all the time. And obviously that's a that's a requirement for any any commerce site, anything that you want to run your business through. So they were able to accomplish this. By, by using the Lightbend technology, using Akka and our frameworks. The, the reduced footprint has saved them nearly 40% per year in their bill for, for infrastructure. So the amount of footprint that they 
they were uh, running their old system on versus what they're running it on now has shrunk by 40 percent. And then lastly, I think I have one more, ING. ING is, if you're not familiar, that's a large international bank uh, based out of the Netherlands. They have offices all over the world. Uh, they were looking to replace a very old COBOL-based system. And some of us have been around long enough to remember programming in COBOL. It's hard to find COBOL programmers. It's hard to maintain COBOL-based systems. So this is a SWIFT payment system. Anybody who's been in the banking industry knows what this is and, and is experienced with SWIFT payment systems. They decided they needed to replace it and replace it with something that not only was more modern and could be maintained, but would allow them to add functionality in a, in a, in a more rapid fashion. You know, the old COBOL-based system, I'm sure it hasn't changed much over the years. So they have, uh, they're not done with this, they're in process. This is also an OpenShift cu customer. Uh, their plan is, is to roll this out at the beginning of next year. So we'll see how uh, see how many COBOL programmers are left in the market after. Uh, I think there's, there's probably a, a, a few. There's still a few. There's, there's still people who are who are writing writing um, applications for OpenVMS. I know. I know. Hard to believe. So you see uh, the, the beautiful OpenShift console here, right? Wonderful. All right, so I'm going to maybe flip over to an app. So I'm going to show you two demo apps, both running Akka, both running in a, a Kubernetes environment. Uh, one's running on my laptop using uh, OpenShift uh, code-ready containers. You know, it's a developer tool. Uh, for me as a developer, I, I want a, a, you know some kind of a Kubernetes environment. So this first app, it's on, behind the scenes, um, I'm actually running in an Amazon environment, but behind the scenes, uh, there's two Akka microservices, and, and they're both running a, a number of pods in, in a cluster. So in another, the second demo app, I'll kind of show you the anatomy of this thing. But here I just wanted to show you kind of a little bit more realistic type of an application. So the user interface to this demo app is a, is a map. It's like a Google map. The concept is that this is simulating an IoT type of an application. So these markers that are distributed around the world on the map are showing locations of these simulated IoT devices that are uh, created using this demo app. And the real goal of this app is to create some load. We're trying to push the parameters of how hard can we push Akka, how hard can we push an OpenShift Kubernetes environment, how, and probably the biggest one is how hard can we push the backend databases that this thing interacts with. So uh, just to, to show you, you navigate around this thing just like you do with Google Maps. And I'm going to zoom into the area around London. And as I get closer, you start to see where there's these highlighted regions. And what's happening here is this is showing where um, these hypothetical IoT devices have been placed. You know, so each IoT device is in a certain region on the map that's bounded by <clears throat> a rectangular area that you know, falls within, you know, Kind of a top left, bottom right, longitude and latitude. But if you, how does Akka, Hugh, how does Akka know that? Are they are they all phone? Are the IoT devices phoning home to to a, a central? Yes, exactly. Yeah, great question. So what what this demo app is doing is that one service is I'm using that to simulate the outside world, like IoT devices that are sending in telemetry messages into another services. So this is what's happening here. There's the second service is receiving these telemetry messages saying things like, hey, create a device at this location on the map. Uh, is the device happy? Is the device sad? You know, that kind of a state change or delete a device. So, it, you know, it's a, it, this is a demo app. It's intended for developers to take and, you know, implement or get running on, on their own, say, in uh, code-ready containers, play around with it and learn about Akka, but, you know, kind of a, a more realistic example. And the, the, the JavaScript and everything that I'm using to make this map work and so on is something I wrote that's included with the demo app. So that the developer can take all this and make it work. But on the back end system, there's um, Akka is a uh, the actor model on the JVM. And actors are kind of glorified objects. So if you're a developer of any kind, you know, or if you heard about you know, software development, commonly you hear about object-oriented programming, well, actors are kind of very much like objects, you, you know, they're written in the same way that objects are written, 
but they have a, a kind of a unique characteristic. And the unique characteristic is the only way you interact with an actor is you send it a message, an asynchronous message, versus uh, how you would interact with, say, a normal object written in Python or, or, or Java or something like that. So in this system, what I'm zooming in, but in, as you, you can see, as I'm mousing around here, moving their mouse, it, it's kind of it's pulling data from the back end. Um, but there's 1,024 devices. So in this region that I'm over right now. So on the back end of the system, there's 1,024 actors that are alive that know the state each individual device. Now in this map on the bottom right, you know, it's showing that there's like 223,000 devices that have been created. So what that means is there's 223,000 live actors, you know, kind of hot in memory. They know the state of every single device on the map worldwide. And in this view here, I'm looking at around um, 26,000 devices. And, and the idea is that uh, the concept, of, and we got this from the folks at uh, Tesla, you know, they're doing some really cool stuff with Akka and batteries, and they coined the term digital twin. So for every, for every physical device out in the real world, like a battery or a smoke detector or a street light or whatever your IoT system is doing, on the back end, there's a digital twin, which is an actor which is kind of responsible for um, echoing the state of those physical devices out in the real world. One per one per one per one. And where, that's what the, the system's doing. Where, where do the Red Hat, the operators that you folks built for OpenShift, where where do those operators live? So if they're, if you think of there's like in like an AI, you know, artificial intelligent daemon, if you will, that's, that allows, you know, apps to, you know, self-heal and, and helps with configuration management and so forth. Where do the operators fit into this whole, into this whole, whole scheme here? In, with Akka, the main thing is uh, for uh, deployment of the applications to the environment is what we use the operators for. Okay. So one of the things that um, I can do with this app is, um, like I said, I, you know, it's kind of a test bed for demonstrating the, the technology. There's a lot of source code for developers to look at and things like that. It's kind of fun to play with uh, interactively here is I can kind of do things at scale. So for example, I'm gonna create a bunch of devices and I can do through this UI, I can create some devices and it's not like one device at a time. I'm, I'm kind of, backed away from the surface of the earth a little bit. I'm at a, at a level of, of, above the earth where this region can, can, can hold, and this just by design of the application, can hold around 4,000 devices. So if, if I, and I, you know, I can pick a region and if I click it, that sends a request to the backend system and it kind of goes through some gyrations, but then what we see is those individual devices get created. So it, what happened was that the first service got this request, the single request. It cascaded that into 4,000 gRPC messages over the network to the second service. That second service got those 4,000 requests as if 4,000 devices suddenly came online over the course of about four seconds. Did a bunch of database work, did a bunch of actor stuff, and then wrote a bunch of information to the database and we saw it happen in real time. So there's a, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that made all that work, but it runs pretty fast. You know, that was 4,000 know, pretty quickly. I can do my little bit. I'll do it once more just for fun. And create 4,000. I can zoom in to kind of watch them happen at a little bit more granular scale. So you can see the devices start to show up and they're, you know, it's done, right? So there's, you know, there's now another 4,000 devices. So uh, I can zoom out more and generate more traffic, but I want to go to the uh, to the second uh, demo. All right, so this is another demo that's running in OpenShift code running containers on my laptop. The first one was running, you know, a real cloud environment in Amazon um, in Kubernetes, but this one is structurally behind the scenes exactly what this that other application was doing, and it's a way to kind of show uh, a cluster, an Akka cluster in action. So this is showing kind of live things happening within this little demo application. 
the scale is on the on the map i was dealing with hundreds of thousands of things here i'm dealing with hundreds of things it's scaled way down because i can't render hundreds of thousands of things like this can you, can on a, you help you, me, can you help me with something so i so the aka is sort of the core brain if you yes. will right and all of the iot devices that are out there let's i, I don't know you know what what they might be there needs to be some kind of a relationship set up between the companies, the people, and the apps that are running in those IoT devices to get them to talk to the ACA infrastructure. Correct. Correct. Meaning, so how, how does how does that work? Do, does your company um, basically, you know, sell your services to? all these IoT vendors for them to be able to have all their, their information phone home into your systems? No, it's more of we're, we're giving them the tools to build those kinds of systems. We're not giving like an out-of-the-box IoT system, but we're giving them the, the kind of the core tools to do that. And uh, so building things like authenticating new customers and allowing customers to set up devices that would phone home to you know, the back-end system, those types of things are things that have to be implemented in the application, but that's not part of what we provide. We provide them the tools to build those kinds of applications. Okay, so in, in the in the case that Mark Brewer was, was showing there with the, I think it was the Norwegian Cruise Lines customer story, this infrastructure that we're looking at right here would be the infrastructure of the Norwegian Cruise Lines organization and all the little blue dots, all the you know IoT you know devices would be all of their stuff that they use to run their business. Yes. So, and that the demo app, the map app, you know, where I, you know the IoT devices, each one of these little blue circles represents an individual physical device. If this was a shopping cart app, if we if somebody used Aka to build the classic shopping cart app. Every one of these blue circles would be somebody actively interacting with a shopping cart. You know, your shopping cart, my shopping cart, somebody else's shopping cart. These blue, little blue circles represent real actors running in the system. In this demo, again, it's like a, I got 100 or so of these little blue circles running right now. In the map app, I had 225,000 of them. Right. So the idea, though, is that the we're making it easy for developers to write the business logic for handling you know, the manipulations of the devices or the shopping cart or whatever the application has to do in a very distributed environment. So on the perimeter of this circle, I'm showing a bunch of, of you know, 100 or so. Uh, the, the count is down at the bottom here, this entity count. It says 102. It'll change because these things are coming and going because the system's actually you know, percolating along here. Uh, next level up is uh, another kind of actor, which is shards. They're called shards. And if uh, with databases, for example, you know, sharding in databases is a way to kind of delegate work out to uh, multiple places. And, and this is exactly what the shards are doing here. We're using shards to distribute work across the cluster. Par I think pardon me. One of the core functions of, of Spanner, right, was how, how they how they grew the Spanner database was sharding it. Yes, and that's exactly what's going on here. That uh, you know, in this case, um, I've got the number of shards is fixed. You know, the, the actual number. You know, in this case, there's 15 in the map app, but there is like about a thousand shards, and you know, to scale the hundreds of thousands of actors. Um, but the shards are basically their work is really just to distribute, uh, you know, work across the cluster because the big circles here represent pods running in Kubernetes in like in my OpenShift environment on my laptop or in a real Kubernetes environment running say somewhere in the cloud or in an on-premise OpenShift environment. So right now I'm running a cluster of three pods. And those pods of course contain a container and those containers are running a Java virtual machine. Those Java virtual machines in use Akka and the Akka code allows things to collaborate with each other. But it, it also gives us things like, um, I want to kind of show you resiliency and scale. So I want to, if I, I'm going to tag one of these entities by clicking it and it should turn red. All right, just so I tag it. So I'm going to uh, force 
this pod to stop, this pod 19. You can do that just by clicking this up here. So it's, it should shut down in a moment. And what we should see is this entity that I've tagged, as, long, as, as well as a shard, will jump to one of these other pods. There it goes. Beautiful. So it, right away, this is where it recovers. It's like, for me as a developer writing the code that does, you know, handles the entity logic, I had nothing to do with the redistribution of my code around the cluster. That was all handled by Akka. One moment my, you know, I, that the instance for the your shopping cart was running on one pod and the next moment it's running on another pod. It recovers itself. It, it just kind of brushes failure off. It's like, yep, expected that. We know pods come and go. That's just a fact of life. And it just deals with it. So, uh, and in the, the meantime, the beauty of running in the Kubernetes environment is that for a moment we were down to two pods, but I told Kubernetes I want three pods in this environment. So Kubernetes saw that there was a pod down and it started one up and it came back. So the, the Kubernetes is like the perfect, perfect environment for Akka clusters. Akka cluster has been around for a while kind of predates Kubernetes. I, I used to Akka clusters when I used to work at HP and IT. And we had, you know, just like virtual machines. And we really, really need, wanted something like this, you know, a beautiful orchestration environment. Uh, it's just, Akka was waiting for something like Kubernetes. So another thing I want to show you is uh, I'm going to scale up the load a little bit. I can do that by scaling up my load generator, I'm gonna, which is just some pods. So what you should see is the, these, the, on the top right here, these are nodes or pods running in another cluster, and all they're doing is generating traffic that's flowing into this service. You know, it's generating HTTP requests that are flowing in, and I'll show you. So they, these four more spun up. And now the density of the entities is increasing. So it, I'm you know, kind of trying to simulate increasing the load on the system. So now the stress, say, on each of the pods running in this cluster, each of the three pods has gone up. Of course, this is at a very small scale, but say this was you know, a much higher scale. And we, were, we went from around 130 or so, I think, entities, and now we're up around 180. So, of course, with Kubernetes, you can set that up to auto scale, but you can also uh, manually scale. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back over to the OpenShift console, and I'm going to scale up my ACA cluster here. So what we should see is two more uh, pods will show up, to, which contain two more containers, which are running two more JVMs. Those containers will spin up. Those JVMs will light up Akka. They, uh, they reach out and say, hey, I want to join the cluster. You know, here's what, uh, one that just came in. And then the second one should come in. And what you see also is that the shards are, some of the shards are automatically getting redistributed to these new pods. So now we have some extra processing capacity thanks to Kubernetes. And Akka sees this, and, and this is, Part of the, the sharding strategy it goes, ah, I got more capacity. Let me move stuff over there. So it's now Akka recognized that more pods came into the cluster and said, yes. Let me, and I'm going to go and redistribute the, the shards for you? Yes. So zero code that I wrote that makes that happen as a developer, you know, I developed this little demo application. I developed the, um, the map application. I don't run any of the code that does all this rocket science redistribution and stuff like that. That's handled by Akka. And I, I just have to follow a, kind of a very simple prescriptive approach for setting up the way my application works. And I get this kind of out of the box. Um, where, do the, where do the limitations start to come? Meaning like if you, if, if you went back to the, to the OpenShift console and you just you know, cranked it up to be absolutely monstrous is that is that something at, at some point Akka says enough is enough no no actually I mean um, I just heard I think it was yesterday at another conference that somebody recently was playing with Akka uh, a cluster scaling to thousands of nodes thousands of pods 
So the scale can get pretty high. I think uh, before this, I had heard things like, you know, ACA clusters running with say 2000 nodes, things like that. I think more typically though, uh, you, you see clusters run with, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 nodes, those types of things, but we can scale. Hey, you think about it, um, Fortnite, the game runs on ACA. And when there are all these active players at the same time, it needs to scale to some pretty big numbers. I don't think we ever got a final number from the Mahoney nodes, but it's in the thousands. And you know, when it when people aren't playing, it just shrinks down. So it's elastic and therefore their their cost of running the system is only high when they have a lot of people using it. What about the one last go ahead, sorry. monitoring of the devices all the way out on the outside perimeter, does does ACA help with that, or do you integrate with other tools from other APM vendors? So ACA's managing that. You know, so the, yeah, so if. You, I think the like, question was on, on monitoring, providing metrics on the devices. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, we, we've got, as a commercial offering, uh, monitoring that provides instrumentation, you know, it's very specific to ACA, the JVM and so on that can be integrated in with some of the, the you know, the more common um, tools, you know, the uh, application monitoring tools. So yeah, it does that. But it, I mean, as far as things like when a node say fails or a node spins up and we want to redistribute work across it uh, and the decisions to do that, that's all ACA itself, you know, the open source ACA out of the box that does that. Yeah, so telemetry is part of our commercial product, Mike, and telemetry plugs into APM tools like Datadog, and New Relic, and, and others that are out in the market. Yeah. The one last thing I want to show you um, is kind of the flow in the system. So the, I, uh, these extra lines that appeared when I clicked this one circle, you can think of this top right as a load balancer. You know, just a load balancer in Kubernetes. And these HTTP requests are coming in from this load balancer into an HTTP endpoint that's running in this JVM, this one JVM here. And it's getting requests in to uh, send messages to specific entities. So some of those requests are to entities or entity actors that are running within the same JVM as the, you know, where the HTTP requests landed, but many others are in JVMs that are distributed across the cluster. So all the routing of these requests is handled by ACA itself. So it's, as a developer, it's really easy. All I have to do is I write the code that kind of receives the incoming, say, HTTP requests, maybe some JSON or whatever it is, I create an object which represents a message that I want to send off to an entity actor and I identify the entity you know, by some ID that I want to send this message to, and all the routing to either local or remote off to another, you know, node across the network is handled by ACA itself. It, it's all, it, this, we call it location transparency. The, the, the location of the entity actors is completely transparent to the, uh, you know, the code. So when I write my code, I'm writing it as if it were running in a single machine, but it's actually running in a cluster of machines. When I turn them all on, you can see all this flow coming in from uh, the uh, the load balancer, and it's just you know it's kind of a spaghetti bowl, but it's showing you know all the distribution of all these incoming messages around 20 messages per second are coming into this little demo app that are just getting distributed all across the cluster, and it doesn't matter where the HTTP request comes in, we'll always route it to the correct entity actor, no matter where that thing is. And, and that allows us to, to do something with state because a very common pattern for people to develop applications is, is called a stateless type of an application. And the reason they do stateless is that it's hard to do stateful in a distributed environment. But this is exactly what ACA excels at because it has this you know, very powerful mechanism for distributing messages across a distributed environment, which means that we can have stateful actors, which means with stateful actors, we can do things like reduce the load on databases, which means the applications can scale to higher levels of performance. 
That's really cool. It, it, this, is, this has been really helpful too for me. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, the, the, the uh, this visualiz is a, this visualization has been fun. And, and again, this is all, um, these are things that we make av available, you know, it's just stuff I wrote for developers to take play with, maybe show their team, you know, get excited about ACA, see how ACA works. And, um, and and like I said, have a little bit of eye candy. I love doing this eye candy stuff. That was actually great for me because when, when you were talking about the Norwegian cruise lines and, and the cruise ship, I was, you know, I, I was kind of struggling to figure out, okay, so how exactly does ACA fit in there and tie all that together? But now I get it, you know, when you're running these, large complex businesses that are mobile and moving around the world. I, I couldn't imagine trying to manage a business like that without something like what that you folks provide. It, it just, you, you couldn't do it. Well, there's even a, a more um, challenging aspect to Norwegian or any cruise line um, use case. That is that they aren't always connected to the internet. Right, they may be out at sea and they may not have good coverage. You know, the satellite coverage isn't good, or they're too far from shore to get uh, the, the wireless connections there. So the ship itself is a data center, and that data center has Aka running and has pods of Aka running. But when it's close enough to and it has internet connectivity, it expands to the internet. In other words, it uses Amazon, I think, is their their preferred provider. But regardless, it it literally behaves just like that uh, that that visual. Uh, graphic that you were seeing there from Hugh, where all of a sudden there's another pod available. Now I've got the internet so I can start using it to process these things. But when the ship is out too far away from the internet or too far away from the shore or satellite coverage, it still works. Everything works. You know, I was, we were talking about, you know, I mentioned people are still using OpenVMS. I, I used to work for digital. I used to help software vendors port their apps to Alpha, Alpha NT, Digital Unix, Open VMS, and there were there were tools out there made by Computer Associates and BMC and others that were kind of doing something. And correct me if I'm wrong. Kind of like what Akka is doing now in a distributed multi-cloud world. Is is that is that a fair analogy that that some of those more legacy vendors were were doing it? In a data center, but now there's there's applications like Akka that that can take that same type of functionality and and have it running on multi-cloud, whether you're in Amazon GKE or on-prem. Yes, yeah. Hugh, I don't know if you want to make a comment about that. Yeah, that. kind of on steroids. I mean, because <laughs> <laughs> um, I was there, you know, I I worked at HP when and uh, I was kind of technical sales, and digital was our biggest. Um, Competitor by far, um, yeah. back in those back in those days, um, and this is just to a new level. And one thing I wanted to say was the the big challenge we have for people going to the cloud, just like before, was getting to the, unlearn what they know from pre-cloud and learn how to really use the cloud. You know, and the I think one of the one of the strongest things about Aka is that you're kind of forced without a lot of pain and suffering to unlearn a lot of your old habits, adopt these new habits, and you get really where you're really, really using the cloud, right? I mean, you're scaling, you're resilient, you're, you know, if, um, you, if, you, if your Kubernetes auto scales you, it's, it's, it's elegance, you know, auto scaling where you, you know, your actors are redistributed and all this kind of stuff. It's just massively cloud native compared to what most people seem to be doing Kind of bringing forward, oh yeah, we're going to just build our stateless microservices on uh, Kubernetes and it's all good, right? It's like, well, no, you're not really taking advantage of all the really awesome things you get with things like bringing OpenShift, giving, you know, bringing the cloud on-premise to USA, for example, and allowing them to really take advantage of, of the, the power that they're getting, not doing the old things anymore, you know, <laughs> doing the new things. And application modernization is not just buzzword bingo. I mean, it's what no, no. everybody needs to be doing. Yep. Mark, you know, we talked about some of how old we are. We <laughs> talked about present day things with Norwegian Cruise Line, but if if we if com the state of computing has changed so much since 
you know, back in the day to now, what's it going to be like in 24 months from now? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I will say that, that there is a number of movements that um, we're both a part of and watching very carefully, specifically around abstraction, making it easier to build these complicated systems. If you think about all the configurability and, and what frameworks provide you or provide a developer, it gives you a lot of power. But it also takes a lot of work for the developer and even for the ops folks when they put those things into production. We see a world where uh, in 24 months, maybe much sooner, where companies are going to look at serverless, look at ways of abstracting that complexity and therefore losing some of the configurability, but giving it up in exchange for rapid development and, and honestly something that I don't have to worry about that literally has been operated by, by the cloud providers. The service itself just runs. I just write the business logic and deploy it, and it, it, all the rest of it's handled for me. So it, we're, we're, um, we've launched a project called Cloud State, and we're uh, going to be launching a service called Aka Serverless, and that's all about abstracting that complexity and making it much easier to build these comp complex distributed systems. I think that's, that's not just Lightbin that's driving towards that. You see other vendors as well, in, including IBM Red Hat, uh, providing technologies to make it easier to build cloud native based systems and not put a lot of the work on the developer. That's and, and we obviously have an OpenShift serverless offering yep. as well. Although yep. serverless, serverless also could really just mean somebody else's servers. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, yeah, unfortunately, the term is not well defined you, and overused. <laughs> And you need, you need operating systems and kernels to make computers run. It's just where right. are the servers? Um, well, I guess I didn't say it very clearly, but the, the simplest way of describing serverless, at least in, in our context, is abstracting all that complexity and, and configuration type stuff you have to do. So there's less work. It just makes it easier. Less right. drama. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying less drama. You know, the, all the drama of trying to get things working, um, you know, you go to, I mean, I, I kind of look at the world today in three eras. You know, there's pre-Kubernetes, there's Kubernetes, and there's post-Kubernetes, which is serverless. Mm -hmm. And it, it's all about abstraction. Yep. You know, that Kubernetes is a huge abstraction layer that removes so much complexity that we had to deal with, say, in the, you know, when we were dealing with real machines or virtual machines. So now we have this new abstraction in Kubernetes. And then the serverless it takes it to the next level of abstraction where I don't even care about things like pods anymore. And I have no idea about machines. What I, all I'm doing is saying, I will spend up to this much, you know, things like that. You know, I, my, I, I will pay for this much compute power and IoT operations and how you do it, I don't care. I just want my, my app to run, I want it to scale. When things break, I don't want to even hear about it. Don't give me any drama, I just want to focus on the heart and soul of my application. You know, what's what's the business logic? What, what are the features that I want to implement? Yep. Well, we're coming up on the top of the hour. Um, we have a couple minutes left here. If you're, if if I if if I called your your director or VP of marketing, um, would would that person be saying, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe you were on there for an hour, Mark Brewer, and why didn't you talk about the phone?" Let, let, let's let's stop the call from happening right now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to to engage with Lightband is pretty simple. We we obviously provide a lot of open source technology that people take advantage of, but when it comes to engaging with the company, it's all about helping you with your project, making sure you're successful at building those applications, and they meet your business requirements, whatever those business objectives were, whether it was transforming your business to something new or adapting to this new online world where we're not doing as much physically in, in person as we used to, those projects, those business objectives, we want to see them succeed. And so you can find out about Lightbend by going to our website, find out more about Lightbend and its relationship with Red Hat. Um, please, please reach out to us. We're happy to help. And by the way, you'll also be able to see all the use cases and more that uh, we talked about today. And you know, just to, just another another plug. Um, you know, Lightbend is available in the Red Hat marketplace. Right. Um, so people can go to marketplace.redhat.com, find the Lightbend offering that's there, and um, certainly if anyone 
needs to get in touch with Mark and or Hugh, you know, you have Mark's email right there on the screen. We're at the top of the hour. I am Michael Waite, and this has been another exciting edition of the OpenShift Commons briefings with our operator partners from Lightbend. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week.